given a resurgence of religion across the world, it becomes imperative to, to have a discussion how we can accommodate religious diversity and the state's role in the same. With this brief introduction, I am pleased to present Dr. Raju Bhargava. May I request uh, uh, our EML core team member, Deepak Johnson, to hand over the bouquet to Dr. Raju Bhargava. Can I can just move around. Just give me, oh my God, just give me a couple of minutes because I, as I was coming down here, uh, I was told that there has already been a, a fairly intense and heated debate on, on the subject of secularism about a week ago, where, you know, there was, we're soon discussed whether the IIT is a secular place or not. And because uh, so I'm going to start with, with, with that uh, topic and uh, I'm, I'm just going to take one minute to think about you know, what my starting point should be. I haven't had a time to think about this. So I'm, so I'm going to take a cup, you know, just a few seconds. Huh? So you know, I'm. This is. Uh, Should I stop? Can I stop now? Okay. Okay, my first uh, proposition is that human beings are not merely machines. They are agents. What do I mean by that? I mean that they don't just move. Their movement is guided by an intention. That's, what, that's, the, that's the difference between an action and a mere movement. An action is some kind of bodily movement, or even it could be movement in the brain, some, some kind of movement, right, that's taking place, but which is always guided by some intention, right? That's what an action is, as distinct from mere behavior, or even programmed behavior. Uh, so, and, and this is a thought that may be difficult for some of you to, to swallow, but before indivi any individual begins to act as a child, that individual is inserted in a whole network of interlocking actions, right? We, call, we can call them practices, social practices. This is an obvious point. I hope you also see it as obvious, uh, you see this point as obvious as I do, that when we are born, we are born in a network of interactions, right? Interlocked interactions. 
whether it can it can be uh, you know uh, people in a in a in a village your 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 the whoever happens to be your father your mother your brothers your sisters your uncles your grand uncles and so on and so forth it could be a larger group of people or it can be something happening in a hospital you know you might be born in a hospital and so on and that the huge number of people there taking you know doing various things and so on and so we are all born in certain in a set of practices uh, and that's what a whole society is a complex network of practices but just as our intent just as our actions are not mere movement but guided by intention so also all these social practices are guided by some intention there is some goal some purpose and in fact what well, you might say some thought is already in it okay that's my first proposition that these are thoughtful practices into which individuals get inserted and you know they 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 they've got to do something in relation to it they've got to begin to learn them they get initiated into them and they learn them and they and they start acting in certain ways even simple elementary things like walking like sitting like uttering your first word all these are learned through interaction <laughs> if you were to take a child who was not inserted in this body of practices that child will not learn how to sit that child will not learn how to walk or perhaps it might just about you know it might just yeah, i can't imagine you know i i i won't even say it might just i don't think that child will learn anything at all right uh it's in the same way that you learn how to sit walk talk that's the way in which you also learn to think and your initial thoughts are in your speech very often when people think you know think about thinking they think of what i call the rodin model i don't know if you've heard of august rodin who made this very great sculpture called the thinker and it's a man who is sitting and you know in a very pensive mode as if he's he's you know he's all by himself and he's thinking in his head right uh now that kind of thinking in your head <laughs> takes place is a is an activity that you have to learn it's not something that you begin to you you it's not you're not programmed to do it you're not it's not something that you uh, would be able to do if you were not interacting with other people if you were not born into a network of practices if you were not in some ways educated you wouldn't be thinking on your own right this is a very very this is a terrifically innovative act the first time that we not just thought through our action and through our speech but we thought in our heads we privatize our thoughts we turn them into ideas in our head and even when we learn how to think and to have ideas in our head we don't stop thinking through our action through our bodily action and through simply speaking so for example when i'm say driving my car i i I've, i've learned how to change the gears but i don't first have an idea in my head that I, okay now let me change from the first to the second gear i just change it it's a habit i just put it on you know it's something which happens automatically but it's not thoughtless there's a reason why i'm changing the gear from the first to the second second to the third the third to the fourth and so on and so forth 
but it's something which I do almost instinctively, as if it's my habit, right? There's nothing going on in my head when I'm doing all this, but it's all thoughtful action. As a matter of fact, all our, a very large variety of our actions are thoughtful, but not mediated by not going through this entire process of thinking that is taking place in our head. Our thinking that takes place in our head is very, very tiny. It's very tiny, and as a matter of fact, um, it, it, it becomes, uh, if, if it expands, you know, uh, in the sense that it begins to take a greater part of your life, then it is a very specialized activity, something that you guys do, something that people like me who teach do, but it's not something that most people do. 90% of the people, maybe 95% of the people don't have to do all that. They don't, they don't, they don't stop to think very much. They just do things, they do things that they will learn. Learn by being a member of a certain society, learn their practices, learn their whatever, and so on and so forth. It's an... In the small time that we have, when we begin to think something, it, it can, that thinking can happen in a very, in something, you know, very practical. Right? Now, supposing I'm very fond of saying this because I'm, I'm a teacher uh, and, I, and, I, and I, used, rather, I used to be a teacher. I've stopped teaching since 2001, right? I have not taught. I taught from 79 to 2005, uh, 2001 in JNU and from 2001 to 2005 in Delhi University. And then I quit teaching and I haven't taught for nine years, eight years now. But my, when I used to teach, I never I, I never had a laptop, I didn't have those projector, projection, projectors, you know, I didn't write on, a, on, the on something at the table and got projected. No, I used a white, a white chalk, right? So I would write and suddenly the chalk would break and as it broke, I would say, what? I would sort of start thinking about it. You know, what, what kind of a chalk is this? Why is it? Is it really chalk? Is this, I mean, is it made of lime? <laughs> Whatever, lime, calcium, lime, lime, so, something. No, is, is it really, <coughs> or is it all, some, is it made of something else? Is it plaster of Paris or something? Why is it broken? So it's when my activity is interrupted by something, then I begin to think, why has this happened? Or when I see something, I said, you know, I suddenly see a whole crowd of people standing, with, and I and I'm perplexed. So I start saying, what, "What's going on here?" That's also an act of thought, right? Now these are moments that occur. But ima imagine in a, in very settled societies, when nothing very nothing changes very much, there are no strangers coming to so that you can begin to ask questions such as, you know, what the hell? Who is this guy? Or when, he, when that stranger acts, you say, well, well, why is he acting in this way? What's the motive? If that doesn't happen, you know, there's very, there's very little thought is going to take place. Or, you know, there will be thoughtful action, but no reflection. Uh, the reason why I said all that was that, or, one more thing. The, there's a word that I can use here, expression. That my body expresses a thought, but the thought is directly embodied. It's in the act. I have to read off the people, other people who come to watch me act, will have to read off the thought from my action. A lot of anthropologists do that, they just go to an exotic place, and initially they don't know the language, but they still try to figure out what's going on. And they just see, and you know, they wait, they, they are inside, uh, you know, they live there, and they, they, as they're learning the language, you know, they're also trying to observe what's going on, and somehow begin to conjecture that this might be, they may, may be doing this, you know, they may be performing this action for this reason, and so on and so forth. But they are looking at the actions and trying to read off the thoughts of the people who are acting in certain ways through the act. The basic thing that I was saying was that we can, we can, 
we, much before we reflect, much before we reflect in this way, it, you know, like, the, like Auguste Rodin's uh, model thinker, when we have ideas in our head, much before that, we are already expressing our thoughts in actions. Expression is fundamental. And we, even when we become great thinkers, right, we spend a lot of time, 50% of the time, which is very rare, you know, I don't think people do, people spend 50% of the time thinking. Thinking is a, you know, sometimes a very difficult business. It's not easy. But let's say 50% of the time thinking. The rest of the 50% of the time, when they're not speaking, of course, they are expressing through actions. Lots of things they're doing which are Okay, uh, I, said all, I said all that because only a few civilizations have, uh, all civilizations, all human civilizations have huge numbers of people expressing themselves in their actions. And a very tiny number of people who are doing the thinking when they actually begin to do thinking at all. Our civilization, our meaning modern civilization, the world over, our civilization has begun to put a great deal of emphasis on the Roda model and on reflection and rather than just on expression. There is no way they can get rid of expression, right? Expression in, the, in thought, but they, there is a greater value and a greater emphasis that is being placed on, on, on reflection. That is, to have an idea of an entity, either real or imagined, in your head, so that you can say it is being, in some senses, reflected in my head. I am reflecting on it. This is a very, this is, this is the, that, that so many people have begun to do that is a new, new thing. It's not something that was done in the past. There were mandarins in China, there were a small class of Buddhists, uh, sorry, Brahmins in, in, in the subcontinent. You know, there were the theologians in, 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 in Latin world, and there were the philosophers in the Greek world. There were the Talmudic thinkers in the, in the Judaic world, and there were the great uh, uh, interpreters of uh, Quran in the Arab world. But but they were very small in number. And they were doing not just, they were, do, they were thinking, no, they were not just thinking only about God and gods. And they were all, they, they were doing science and you know what we call science. They were doing all sorts of mathematics and all this was happening, but in a very tiny circle. And even today, even all of us who do this, a lot of the time thinking, we, we don't realize it, but we spend a lot of our time expressing without thinking. Now, there are three systematic modes of, of, uh, of expression or thinking. I'm taking them all together at the moment because they're all expression and, and and, 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 and reflection, right? There are three major modes of thinking. At one time, people hierarchized them. You know, they said, this is, this is superior, and this is less than that, and this is the least valuable. And these three were a art, which is systematic expression. You know, in great art, you will not find people reflecting. When, uh, I don't know, when, when uh, Tim Krishna sings, I mean, you know, he, when he sings, he, he's, 
He is, if, he, if he ever, if he waited even for a second to think, it will be destroyed. He can do, he has to practice a lot. You know, Kumar Gandhar or Bhimsen Joshi, all the great classical singers, Kumar Kushir, Kishori Manka, Angubai Hangal, if you've known these names, you know, if you ask them, very few people, Taitiyam Krishna is an exception because he can think a lot about his art. But a lot of people, a lot of these great, some of the greatest people, they don't think about their art. They just express. And we find them great only in their, through their expression. Not because what they have to say about their art. The great paintings, the Picasso's painting, Guernica, or or the great sculpture, or the or great theater. A lot of theater is just gestures. <coughs> Dance is gestures. I mean, there's no there's no no speech, no thought. You know, sometimes you get a little booklet explaining what's happening. But you watch for 100 minutes. There's nothing which is you can, There's no nobody is going to explain to you. A great symphony, nobody is going to explain to you. But these are great works of expression. They express a whole worldview. And thousands and thousands of people spend all their time trying to figure out what the hell is going on in this. They're interpreting them. So art is one. The second is a little bit of a hotspot of various things. But it's got, it's, it, and that's, I'm afraid, uh, something which we badly and wrongly call religion. <laughs> It's got some myths, it's got some, it's always, you know, you always find great stories there. There is poetry there. There is music there. There is a reflection there. There's a philosophy there. There's theology there. There is a, but there's also a lot of direct expression there. There's ritual. You know, how, how things are going to be open how things are going to be formally closed. We just had a little ritual here when I was given this bouquet. Uh, interesting bouquet. Normally <laughs> you get some flowers, <laughs> but I got some wonderful fruits and thank you for that. But it's a ritual. Why the hell do you have to give this bouquet to, you know, to, your, to a guest speaker? There's no need to do that. I, I can just be asked, it doesn't happen everywhere. It doesn't happen everywhere. Some, but something happens. You see, even if I go to Australia or to Rome or something like that, you know, at the end of it, I, I get a little, you know, some university uh, paperweight or a cup or something like that. <laughs> take it, take it home. It's for you. And as a matter of fact, there's something else which is taking place now. There's a, there's a modification. So instead of a bouquet, uh, you get an already. You get 3,000 bucks or $3,000 or... <laughs> so you can, you can buy whatever you want and that would be from us. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, we all indulge in that. It's nothing unusual. It happens. So there is uh, art and then there is religion and I would include uh, not just, I would include all the things that I mentioned, huh, including ritual and everything. That's part of religion. And then there is a third level, which is philosophy and theory. Where the main thing is you, th that reflection has become supreme, right? And you, it's concept formation, articulated as concepts. You have conceptual, a lot of energy is being spent on finding the right concept. And concepts are all, you know, making distinctions, making a, a demarcation, having something fall into this box rather than that box. There's a lot of classification. All this is going on over here. There's argument. Uh, there is deductive argument, inductive argument, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. And there is... There is some generalization which is being made, and, and if it is empirical, then you have to find the right evidence. Apart from the argument, you have to find the evidence. But if it's more speculative in nature, then you give all kinds of, it's called transcendental argument, right? And, 
I don't want to go into that, but you do all that. And, but it's all taking place. It's all very heavily conceptual laden of conceptual, uh, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on conceptual things, and there's a lot of time spent in reflection, which is sometimes collective, but a lot of the time it's individually manufactured. It's sort of something taking place in your head, you're thinking, writing your book. You need, you need to lead a bit of a life as a monk and so on. But I think that these are three very distinct and three very interesting ways in which we express ourselves, we tell stories about ourselves, and we come to know ourselves. These are modes of self-understanding. We won't know who we are unless we get these three things. We can, we can reject one and rely on just two, or reject two and rely on just one, but that rejection will never be complete, I can tell you that. You never completely reject one or the, any of these three. They'll, something of it will always be there, as indeed, it's supposing you were all, you know, great uh, politicians and, and, and didn't believe in any rituals and so on, even you will end up trying to give me or somebody a bouquet like that. So, uh, the reason why I spent so much time on this was because I thought I better tell you in advance what my views are on, on secularity uh, by, by giving uh, this, this 15 minute introduction uh, and, and, by, and, and on the, my views on whether or not institutions can, should have any rituals or not. I mean, you know, we can, if we dispense with one ritual, we'll have another. If we dispense with the second, we might have a third. If we, we will not get rid of them. This is part of our DNA. This is what makes us human. We are, we are expressive creatures. No matter how much scientific work we do, work we do and what, how, how great we become as scientists, we'll never get rid of these things. You won't get rid of, I'm pretty convinced, I don't think we'll get rid of art and religion and philosophy and theory. And, and theory and philosophy are among the last, you know, the most, uh, I won't say the most developed, but certainly the last, uh, the, the, the latest. Okay. Abstraction has always been there for a very long time. But this kind of systematic theorization and systematic philosophization, that is something which is new. It's not something that we have uh, so I think it's with this kind of, uh, with this kind of a broad understanding that I want to approach the question of, you know, whether A, B, or C is secular or not, and what it means to be secular, number one. And number two, uh, the topic that we're going to discuss now, which is, which is how should states deal with religious standards. Okay. So let's, uh, I've, 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 I've said that, you know, whether, uh, I, I think religion is a terrible name for, for the, that, the second mode of expression that I talked about. But I'm going to continue to use it because now it's at a globe, it's, it was the first words that became globalized. And it became globalized in the 19th century. It's as late as that. I don't think even uh, people in Europe who first began to use this term religion, I don't think uh, in the 17th or 18th century, I don't think they would, and any one of them would have understood what the hell it meant. Nobody would have known what religion meant. They, they understood something. They understood a term called religio. They understood religiosity. They understood religious, but they did not understand religion. Because remember, religious is an adjective. And adjectives are qualities of something. So when, when a person is religious, so a person, you don't, well, you don't talk about, well, you can make tables also religious. 
right? You can turn, you know, make them sacred and say this is religion. So. But it's more or less secondary. I think, let's say religious, religious the quality of being religious is a, is a property of a human being. We are religious. Religion is an abstract noun. It's a system. And it's a system to which we belong. It's not a property which belongs to us. It's rather a system to which we belong. And this is a new idea in the history of the world. 19th, 17th century. It's actually something that developed in the wars of European wars of religion. Nobody knew anything called religion. People were religious. Well, that's an overstatement. But sometimes, you know, we overstate things. I won't want to say that nobody knew. No, there are lots of attempts which were made and they failed. People attempted, but it didn't, it didn't work. So something like, something, something was drawn, some idea of religion grew, and it just flopped. And so people settled back again to religiousness and so on. So religios religiosity. And religiosity is what, you know, is the, religiosity meant piety. Pious people, gods, uh, God-fearing, in the case of monotheistic religions, God-fearing people, but God's loving would be the polytheistic, right? Not God-fearing. I mean, God, maybe some gods that we fear as well in some cases, but largely it's God-appeasing. God's appeasing religions like ours. We want to appease all the gods. We want to celebrate them. We want to do various things with them. Normally, we don't fear gods in Hinduism. In India, largely, uh, you know, both, since everybody believes in shrines and so on and so forth. Anyway, uh, so religion is a Religion is, but, but, you know, religion is a new term, but all these other things like tying a thread, uh, uh, you know, which somebody else will come and untie and then your wish is going to be, you know, all that business of to believing in something which will have, which <coughs> has some enactment. I mean, this was something which was very, very common, but nobody thought that this was something called religion. But, so, all these things have been around, and, uh, yeah, now, I'm going to talk about, uh, late, I'm, so what I'm going to say now, since I've just explained all this, and I've also said that religion is a modern phenomenon, I'm going to talk about religious diversity only in the modern context, from 19th century onwards, when it becomes a pretty much of a global idea, when suddenly Hinduism is born, as an ism, Buddhism is born as an ism on the lines of Christianity, which was also, which was born just a little earlier. There were Christians, but there was, you know, Christianity as, was something which was, not many people knew that there was something called Christianity till the 16th or 17th century. And from then onwards, you have all these other religions. There is one exception, however, and that is Islam, but that's a, as we just put aside for the time being. So I'm going to talk about this kind of diversity. So what is, uh, let me ask a question, what is this religious diversity? And religious diversity, you can say, has three different components to them. Let's say there's a continuum, and on the one hand there is what I can call external religious diversity, and on the other side of the continuum is internal religious diversity. Uh, external religious diversity is diversity of religions, right? Modern 19th century religions. Diversity of religions, which means that in a society there is Hinduism, there is Buddhism, there is Jainism, there is Christianity, there is Zoroastrianism. There is Islam, there is Judaism, and so on and so forth, or if not all of them, at least a large chunk of them. That society is religiously diverse. But this is external diversity, right? Because these are distinct religions, already well demarcated from one another. Okay? Then on the other hand is internal religious diversity, 
And this is a very peculiar thing, and I'm just going to talk about it. But let me just talk about something which is bang in the middle. And that is, uh, you know, maybe internal, maybe external. And what are these? Well, every religion, the basic beliefs and practices of every religion have been interpreted in many, many ways by different people. There is no single way of interpreting them. And over a period of time, a group of people have come together, banded themselves together, and started to call themselves as a sect of that religion or as a subgroup within that whole religious group. So we have, uh, in, in Islam, we have Shias and Sunnis and Ahmadiyas and, and, and the, and the Khoya, Khoja, uh, the Ismailis and the Aga Khanis and so on. And in Christianity, you have Protestants and, and Catholics, and within Protestants, you divide into Methodists and Presbyterians and this and that, Anabaptists and so on. Um, and, and likewise, you know, you can just, even Hinduism, you can, it would be a little awkward to do this, but you can do that. You can say that in, the ninth, in some parts, some parts, you know, some uh, periods, there were Vashtavites and Shavites and Shaktas and this and that, and these all kind of dif different, different, right? And so there is this diversity, and then there is this internal diversity, uh, which is, can become external if Catholics and Protestants become too widely divergent and they start thinking of themselves as religions on their own. So even though they began from the same source, they are now different, or Sikhism for that matter, which began as just an offshoot of the Hindu, the teachings of all the, or, or, all what we call Hindu figures, religious figures, and then suddenly it's become a separate entity, and so on. But there is a third kind of diversity which is very, very important, and that is this, that in every religion, there are some groups which have always remained marginalized. They're never really, they never really get into the mainstream. They're excluded from participating in the mainstream activities, rituals, ceremonies, and so on. They have to be out, out outside. They have to remain outside. Uh, very often, women are like that. They can't participate fully in some activities. And there are some groups which are like that. So, for example, the former untouchables in India were always outside the mainstream. Even the Sudras were not quite in the mainstream. Right? The untouchables were the Ati Sudras, but the Sudras were also not quite in the mainstream. There were the three upper castes used to be present, and there were, you know, there was a great battle always going on between the Kshatriyas and the Brahmins for hegemony and so on. But but and the the Vaishyas also found the path in the full system, but the Sudras and the, they were really out. And when they were outside, you might think that they were, they were innocent bystanders and they would just watch everything happen, but that's not the case. They developed their own practices. They developed their own thoughts. They may, we, may, we may not recognize them, but they developed their own thinking. And so there, there was another kind of diversity that developed of the excluded and the marginalized, which was kind of liminal in some ways. It was neither here nor there. It didn't really have a name, a proper name, and so on. But that also developed. And that's also something which I want to include as part of religious diversity. And in this, this kind of religious diversity was a product of certain power relations. It was precisely because some people were excluded from certain mainstream practices that they had to develop some other practices. And those practices, even when they were recognized, were always seen as lowly, as demeaning, as somehow inferior. So ideas of superior and inferior were already very much around. That brings me to a very important point about all these forms of religious diversity. And that is that wherever there is religious diversity, wherever there is religious diversity, whether it's in India, or in Europe, or in the United States, or, or in the Antarctica, anywhere. Wherever there is religious diversity, there is bound to be the potential, the threat, 
and very often the realization of some kind of discrimination, marginalization, exclusion, humiliation, degradation, oppression. And I want to put this all together and say that this was like, like let's call it domination. Wherever there is diversity, there are prospects of, it doesn't have to become real, the prospects of domination. So within external diversity, there are prospects of inter-religious domination. In the middle, there are prospects of inter-sectarian domination. And in the, on the latter side, it's very obvious that there is intra-religious domination. It's intra-religious domination is when members of one religious community are doing all these nasty things to their own members who by force have to develop other kinds of practices. And external religious domination is when members of one religious community begin to do all these nasty things to members of other religious communities. So Hindus doing it to Muslims or Muslims doing it to Hindus or Christians doing it to Muslims, Muslims doing it to Christians and so on. So Muslims doing it to Jews or Jews doing it to Muslims. These are all, you know, inter-religious domination, right? And that brings me to a very important point, that when we talk about how should states deal with religious diversity, we're not just talking about something very elementary, like, you know, it's a simple question of management of, of heterogeneity, and, you know, just make sure that everybody is uh, being together, no, the, the question is how should states respond to these forms of domination, inter and intra-religious domination. And the question we have to ask is what kind of state there must be that responds well to these forms of domination. And when I say well, responds well to, I mean tries to minimize, the ultimate aim is elimination, right? But at least tries to minimize these two forms of domination because any oppression or discrimination or exclusion or marginalization is experienced, as, you know, if anybody experiences, you know that it's experienced as something which is very, very nasty indeed. It's not something that you like. It impoverishes your life. It doesn't allow you to do things that you really want to do. It doesn't, it, allows you, it doesn't allow you to lead the life as you wish to lead it. It doesn't allow you to pursue your good. Whatever you think is your good, it doesn't allow you to do that. It is, it's, it's constantly places obstruction upon you. It makes it more difficult. It penalizes you for doing your own things instead of facilitating it. So, so I think this responsibility of the state, as indeed the responsibility of a whole number of people, is to somehow get rid of it. And if you can't get rid of it, at least to minimize it. That's a laudable aim, to minimize it. So what kind of state can do that? What kind of state can minimize it? And let's look at two or three different possibilities. You know, there is a theocratic state I hope you understand what I mean by theocratic. Right? No? Okay. Theocratic state. People confuse it with some other kinds of religious states. But theocratic state is a very special kind of state. A theocratic state is one where the religious, the religious class, those who are supposed to be experts in performing religious activities, they become rulers. In the name of God, they become rulers in your society. So, if people who are, if the Pope begins to rule, then it's a theocratic. If Ayatollah Khomeini rules, that is theocratic. But in Pakistan, for example, you, you might think it's a religious, but Islamic state and so on, it's not a theocratic state. 
the general is ruling or a, demo, or, or a political party guy is ruling. It's not a theocratic thing. <laughs> now, you can imagine how difficult it would be if a single, if a person, if a, if the, if a devout religious person, a dogmatic religious person, was to actually occupy political, take political, seize political power, and there are all sorts of religiously diverse people there, then what's going to happen? First of all, the greatest danger is actually not to people of other religions. The greatest danger is to the dissenters of his own religion or her own religion. First problem. You must understand the nature of these characters. They go for heretics before they go for infidels. They'd rather have people who don't believe in their religions live than allow people who deviate from what they believe is the right thing to do. They would rather get rid of them first. So, theocratic states, you can imagine that if you want to Minimize intra-religious domination, please don't have theocratic states. Intra. And also external religious, external religious diversity, inter-religious domination. Also don't expect very much from in theocratic states, don't expect very much uh, in relation to inter-religious domination. They would want their religion to but not just dominate and hegemonize, but to take control of everything. So if our goal is minimizing intra and inter-religious domination, forget about a theocracy. No, no way. But then what about, and there's another kind of religion-centered state, which is, uh, which is uh, a state which it, there's a term which the Americans use, perhaps the term Europeans use, in their context, to establish religion. I don't know how many of you know the American Constitution. Do you? The American Constitution. A little bit. Something about the American Constitution. The American Constitution, the First Amendment of the, to the American Constitution said, the state shall not establish any religion. As a matter of fact, there is a demand that the state disestablishes religion. Establishment means that, you know, there is a separation that has occurred. Okay, religious people are not going to be the political rulers. The religious class and the political class have become different. There is church-state separation. Or there is a sangha-state separation. The monastic order and the political order have become separated. But after separation, when power has come to the political class, that political class, in order to legitimize itself and in order to do various other things, after all, they also want to control everybody. And they know that a lot of people are religious, so they tie up with the religious guys. They have links with the religious guys. They have formal alliances with them. They have legal alliances when I mean declare that okay we are a state run by political people but we are a Hindu state or we are a you know Catholic state or a Protestant state or an Islamic state where only one religion will have monopoly right in established religions that's what happens when you establish a religion that religion has a monopoly so the the, the if you want to, uh, if you want to, if the, the state is going to collect taxes from everybody, and a part of the taxes will go to build churches, and those churches must be, if it's a Catholic state, then only the Catholic church will be built. The money is coming from everybody, but the Catholic church is being built. Education, religious education in schools. But what kind of religious education? Only Catholic education. Only Jesuits are teaching. I'm building a scenario. I'm not saying this is happening everywhere. Many states have got rid of this. 
and the same is true that what happened when pakistan from being a from being it was a kind of a dictatorial authoritarian state it was it began as a secular state then it became a dictatorial authoritarian state and then it became for a brief period it again became a democratic state and then it became an islamic state so it declared that sharia rule of rule by sharia a sharia is a much misunderstood term and i I don't want to go into the positive connotations of Sharia. There are, but but I'm just focusing on the negative ones because in Pakistan it had a lot of negative connotations. Uh, it's ruled by Sharia, and you know priority had to be given to Islam and not to any other religion, and so on and so forth. And that was because it was an Islamic state. Briefly, it has happened even in Bangladesh, in Sri Lanka. It's happened, you know, unfortunately. It's a Buddhist state. This was the rule in Europe till the 20th century. <coughs> Even today, seven European states have establishment. Can you believe it? Europe is supposed to be so secular. Seven European states have established. One of the great states of Europe. Which is which one which one should really try, in some ways, emulate Sweden, because it has a whole variety of it. It's a it's a wonderful place in some ways. It's just disestablished religion. Recently, Norway is still an established state, uh, established religion. Denmark has also got an established religion. Now you know it's the. It's become establishment has become weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker, but it's not disappeared. It's still there, right? Norway and so on. The many states which have established, and in established states, you give some preference to your own religion, greater preference, greater you know. At one time, in all these states, it was not just great, a little more preference. It was just dominant. This is the only religion which is going to be publicly present. No other religion will have public, have public will be publicly visible. They can be there, but but they have to be private. So, in in Europe, for example, in the 16th, 17th century. If the state declared itself to be a Catholic state because the king was a Catholic, then even if 50% of the people were Protestant, they had to change to Protestant. They had to convert to Protestant, and those who did not convert, they were either expelled or exterminated. This is the history of Europe, which we tried to emulate in 1947, by the way. And when some of them survived, who were not expelled or or exterminated, there was exchange of tra the transfer of populations also. By the way, all this taking place in 16th century Europe, and Europe is nothing but a conglomerate of various, you know, homogeneous religious states. That has, that that homogeneity is broken only now in the 20th century with the migration of people from India and from Pakistan and from various other parts of the world and so. On. But when, what I'm saying, when these guys, when some of them remained over there, they couldn't build a church. If there were Protestants in Catholic states, they couldn't build a church. They certainly couldn't build a church facing the main church on the high street. If they built a church, it had to be tucked away in the by lanes, long, far, further away, furthest away from from the main high street. And even then, it couldn't. They, that building couldn't look like a church. It had to look like a residential place or something like that. People were worshiping inside, but if, if, you know, from the from if you just walk past them, you wouldn't tell that these were. This is a place of worship. You would imagine that there are people staying there. In most places of worship, have recognizable qualities. You see, a, 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 a mosque has a minaret. A Hindu temple is sort of. You know, it's got a this kind of a, what is it? Uh, huh? No, not a dome. It's got a it's, it's more like a shrunk. You know, it's got a, a this this kind of quality. 
the churches have steeples, you know, there. So you can recognize the Jewish synagogue always got a star. Now imagine, imagine if you, all this was banned. And, uh, you know, a small, a place where, you know, your, 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 one room in your, in your hostel was a little larger and that room was where you could pray. Nobody could tell whether there was something, what was going on inside, praying or worshipping or there was somebody staying there. That was the state of Europe. Sunday century. That is a, that those are the states with established religion. Now, in the 20th century, those establishments have either disappeared or they have weakened, but they're still there. And I don't think if you're really looking for minimizing uh, religious domination, intra or inter, just sit for one minute. If you're looking for minimizing inter or intra religious domination, then forget about it. You can't rely on on uh, on on states with establishment. So I think, what's the third, broadly speaking, what is the third alternative? The third alternative is a state which has separated itself from all religions. Distance, some distance from all religions. That state at least has the possibility of minimizing inter and intra-religious termination because it is not enmeshed in it. It's not enmeshed in, it's, it's not a party to the, to, the, to, the, to the conflict or to the, to the rivalry or to the, to the hegemonic or dominant aspirations and so on. It is not a party. It must, it keeps itself outside. To the extent possible, it's not always entirely possible because after all the human being, the state is not some extra human machinery, as I said. It's made up of human beings. And those human beings have to run the state. And those human beings are flawed human beings. They are partial, they are, they are biased, and they, they do all kinds of things, and so on and so forth. But at least the principles on the basis of which you, you take an oath, and, and the principles on the basis of which you run your state are very clearly you know, not in favor of the domination of one religion or the domination of a group within that religion, intra or inter-religious domination. And, so. and that is a state which, rightly or wrongly, just as the word religion is sometimes, is somewhat unfortunate, the word secular is also not a great term. It's got a whole lot of connotations, which are sometimes, you know, those negative connotations to secular are justified. But let's just call it a secular state. So my proposition is that if you want the, to minimize inter or intra-religious domination, please don't go for theocracies or states with establishment. Go for a secular state. That's why you need a secular state. So how should states respond to religious diversity? How should states respond to inter and intra-religious domination? Well, the first thing it has to do is to distance itself from all religions. Then there is hope and there is a possibility of it minimizing those two forms of domination. Let it be a secular state. Now, not every secular state is a, is a state that one can back. Unfortunately, there are some states which are deeply, they are so self-righteous about their non-religiosity. They are so convinced that religion is a terrible thing that they take it upon themselves to eliminate religion altogether, not just domination, but to eliminate religion altogether. They are anti-religious states. Aspects of this anti-religiosity are found in France, in Turkey. They were found in the former communist states. They are still found in China. Secularism gets a very bad name 
when states behave in this anti-religious manner. I don't want to, I don't want these secular states. They are secular, it's right to call them secular, but this is a secular state that I don't want to endorse. This is a secular state that I don't want to back. I don't want such secular states. And, I, and therefore I want to redefine the notion of secularism. I think it's high time we define, redefine secularism. A lot of people think of secularism as either anti-religious, so that, and that really uh, scares off a lot of uh, uh, Muslims in, in, in many countries, though not all Muslims, because a lot of Muslims are very secular. They want to bring uh, they, they, they want to bring about a secular state of the of a ferociously anti-religious variety. Sometimes, <clears throat> don't forget that Turkey is is a state which has a majority Muslims, right? And Turkey was a fiercely anti-religious state for for 30, 40 years. So there's no there's nothing. It's not as if Muslims are intrinsically religious or a such thing. They can be secular, and they can be secular in a pretty fierce manner, when they want to be, right? But I, what I want to say is that secularism should not be seen as anti-religious, nor should it be seen as non-religious. Secularism should be defined as a perspective, a stance, an ideology which is against institutionalized religious domination. In both forms that I mentioned, inter-religious and intra-religious, in both these forms. That's what secularism is. That's what secularism should be. And that is what the main objective or purpose of secular states should be. If secular states do not attend to these issues of domination, they're not being true to their name. They're not being, they're not just being uh, uh, second. <coughs> so when Kamala Hassan says that I want to go and live in a secular state, he's actually accusing the current state of Tamil Nadu to be responding to, illegitimately responding to all kinds of religious lobbies and not behaving in a manner which will eliminate the domination of the religious, of the non-religious, the domination of one religion over another religion or intra-religious domination of some kind. This is what a secular state must do, and obviously he thinks that this is not happening. I think he's probably right, but I don't know. I don't know enough. This is something which I only read in the papers today. Now, uh, I think I, I'd like to stop because I, I want to have some interaction and some questions. But I want to link up with uh, the, the point that I made uh, very early on. I think you understand why I'm not an why I'm not anti-religious and why I don't want states to be anti-religious. I don't want to be anti-religious and I don't want states to be anti-religious because I think that the, what a whole variety of things that like storytelling or like the rituals and, you know, and, and uh, uh, myth-making which, is, uh, which, which shouldn't be seen only as false consciousness or anything. All these are in eliminably human expressive activities which have been going on for thousands of years. Much before we began to do theories and philosophies and what we call science. We've got to make sure, we don't want to, and this is something that we won't get rid of because this is our protection against various things. 
But what we can do is to make sure that no religion, no person from one religion is excluded, oppressed, denigrated, humiliated, or, uh, exploited on the ground of religion by some other religion or by members of his own religion or her own religion. And I think that is a worthy goal and we should all strive for it. I don't think there's any point in striving for an anti-religious state. When you start doing that, then you, in the name of secularism, you, began, you begin to take away people's freedoms and you create new hierarchies between some kind of scientifically minded people and religious people and so on and so forth. And I think, I think if, if you do not, if you do not have a, 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 the right kind of religious bone in you, it doesn't mean that you have to believe in God or gods or anything. A lot of the, lot of religious people, you know, they don't much care about these things. But they believe, they, they do a lot of expressive activities. And if we don't have a religious bone in it, then there is something the matter with it. You know, you, you're becoming too dogmatic about one thing. Where are, there are three very interesting modes by which we express ourselves. And, and we may not, we may lean on one rather than the other, but we cannot eliminate all three. Or any, any two at the extent you know, uh, and, and, and just live on one. We can't do it. Uh, and, and that's why it's so important that we are just focusing on, we just focus on these domination bit and not bother too much about being anti-religious. I, I, my, 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 my distinctive work, I mean, I, I, this different, this redefining secularism is something which I say that I, you know, this is my little contribution to the immense feat so there's another contribution, uh, which I'm not going to talk about, but I see that it's close to nine and I want to have a proper discussion. So, thank you. Thanks for the interesting insights you have shared with us, Dr. Rajiv Vartava. Uh, so now, uh, we will have a question and session for 15 minutes, and uh, we will pass on the mic to you. Please be patient. I can, I can actually... Do you have more than 15 minutes? The first question... The first question that I would like to ask is that you have talked about... Where is it coming from? Ah, there. So there was a person standing there and the sound was coming from somewhere. So my, you know, I was wondering whether... My senses are in order. So the yeah. first question is uh, basically on the lines that when we talk of a state that is trying to eliminate or even minimize dominance, there is a very specific aspect and a chance where it can be branded as anti-religion because ultimately anti-religion is an opinion. For example, like we could take uh, instances from the modern uh, so-called Sharia and uh, Parda kind of laws but even if we look at a uh, few years back in our own country there was a point of time when the state came in and said no Sati right so people can stand up and say anti-religion what happens is that being secular is that being anti-religion well I mean anti-religion means that you have you will not just be against Sati but you will be against every practice of of what was, I don't know what, of the Hindus, H-I-N-D-O-O-S, right? There was no, there was nothing called Hinduism at that time, but it was something called, something of the Hindus. Now those Hindus, every practice of them, if they were, if, if the state began to ban all that, then I would say it is being anti-religious. But this is clearly an instance of inter-religious, intra-religious domination, right? I mean, uh, but everything is not intra-religious domination. If somebody goes and, and watches the Ram Leela, or if someone goes and worships, uh, you know, even if someone pours milk on, on, on the Shivalingam or, or, or feeds uh, uh, the, uh, Ganesh with something, you know, 
I think there are other arguments against it. I, you know, if people are dying of hunger and you're wasting milk, you know, you can give other arguments against it, but you can't actually ban it, right? You can't say this is a terrible thing, a terrible activity, and so on. If states are anti-religious, then they would do that as well. So, if you pick out one or two, if you can clearly show that there's an element of exploitation, and show that the state is, act is not, you know, it's not interfering in every goddamn activity of that religion, then I don't think you can say that the state is being anti-religious. You can only say that the state is against a particular kind of domination that is taking place and which involves religion. Of course it does involve religion. You are, you you know, I, I call this embodying an attitude of critical respect. See, you, you know that, you know, if, if a person does something which is wrong, who you are not related to, you feel offended by that, but, but it doesn't, you know, you don't feel it at that level of, you know, you don't feel it in your guts. You're not repulsed by it. But if you find your father doing something wrong, you're repulsed by it. If your mother is doing something wrong, you're repulsed. If your child is doing something wrong, you, you're really agitated. In other words, that which you care very deeply about, if some filter accrues to that, then you feel it is your responsibility to do something about it, to change it, you know, to get, get rid of that wrong. Because you love that person. You don't want to eliminate them. You don't want to say, I want to kill you. You don't say that. You just want that person not to do something wrong. And as a matter of fact, you want to restore the, the little respect that is just uh, being lost. You want to restore that respect. You want to respect it. You want to love and respect your people, you know, right? Your, the people you really care about. Now, the same, the same way you have to look at your... If you are a religious person, you must have your critical faculties. And you must... You, if, you want that religious, if you want your religion to grow, you must do everything in your capacity, individual or collective capacity, to make sure that it is something which is wrong, blatantly wrong, like, like forcing women to, to go on a, a funeral pyre, making that into a custom and saying that this is a religious custom and this is something that you must do and so on. You must fight, you must fight that, right? I mean, and this, you can't, this doesn't, it doesn't follow from that that you're against your religion. You're against a filth in your religion. And why not? So I, I, I look at it like that. I don't see the state, if the state is, is against these activities, but is also supporting some other activities of the same religion, then why do you have to believe that the state is anti-religious? An anti-religious state will be intrinsically opposed to religion per se. Therefore, any activity of that religion will be considered to be bad and therefore to be eliminated. This is this kind of judgment that see. So, so I, 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 I don't quite. Uh, I hope you understand what I, you know. I mean, I, I, I I'm not sure whether you can this. You are. Uh, the fact is that uh, as of the. Uh, action or as a secular, I would brand such a state as secular definitely like so as you have been saying which yeah. it tries to eliminate such a practice but there are two very uh, concerning facts that carry on from this. It's not always that an action is so clearly black and white when we talk in terms of say Sati. Yes. For example if we have the, uh, the Parda or the Burkha, Nikah, whatever the name that you take. Let's wait for a minute. Uh, if, if one person leaves, then I can tolerate that. But if 20 people are leaving at the same time and I'm, we ask the question, then I find I, I can't concentrate. So we can wait for everybody to leave and then we will have a chat. All those who want to leave just now, in the middle of the question, please leave before the question is... Or leave after the question, but don't leave in the middle because then I can't focus, you know. 20 people is too many, one person is okay. <laughs> So the fact is not everything is black and white. There are often cases, if we take the example of Burka Parda like, over there, what happens is 
that too is a curbing of intrinsic human freedom. Yes. But not everybody will be willing to accept that. Yes. Some people will say it is not a degradation, it's not a domination. So these are things which is going to, you see, if this is, if there is a contest taking place, it means there is already some freedoms which are available to people. People are fighting about whether or not it is exploitation. It is oppression. But if and I would standard. wait, I wouldn't go and ban it. You know, if you're talking about, you see, Shati is, is, a, is a very kind of extreme example. When we talk about burqa or about hijab, I won't ban it. If there's a debate taking place, I would let the debate take place and I would wait for the outcome of the debate and then the state has to decide. The state cannot intervene and suddenly ban it when the debate is not even complete. And usually, these things take 20, 25 years. Don't forget that the so-called social reform movement in India it took a long time. It didn't happen overnight. And if the state begins to act at the first instance on something without any response from the people, then that's an authoritarian state. And then why should we have, why should we accept it uh, even when we like it? Why should we accept it? So, uh, all these things take time and, and, and they have to be resolved, in a state, but the state ultimately has to take a position and take sides. See, the, you know, the balance of forces are there, a the number of competing interests and so on, and the state ultimately has to decide. A secular state must decide, must make a judgment. Must make a judgment, is it or is it not, in, does it or does it not involve domination? And it must be on the side of those who are being dominated. So, in continuation to this, the fact is, if we keep waiting, I definitely have a acceptance of the fact that you cannot just go in barge in and say no ban. I am definitely against such kind of an authoritarian state. But then there is also a question like, if you are a judge, uh, judgment delayed is judgment denied. Like the justice part of it is no, there. No, this is. I mean, this, nobody is being hanged or you know, nobody is being killed. No, this is an issue. These are very important social issues, right? Now, in this case, there are, in supposing there are two views in society, and, and they are talking to one another, discussing it with one another, I would let the debate take place, and I would facilitate the debate. And at some point, I will make a decision, and then it will be in favor of one or the other. But that's... But, but judgment is not, uh, I mean, you see, in this case, as you can see, if you delay the judgment, you're not doing harm to everybody. You're, you know, there is one side which is forcing you to say, quick, abhi do judgment, abhi do. But there's other side that is saying, nahi, abhi, ye, is pe to aap judgment denge, to hum to mar jayenge. Kya karte? So, we have to wait, right? So the fact is, but there are threats involved. Like, I'll, I'll just uh, close it from this point on. Like, for ex I'll, I'll take a different example and go on. Okay. The Kripal of the six, yeah. there's a very clear-cut distinction that you are not allowed to carry weapons onto the flight. Do you allow them or do you not? It's a threat. It, he's not doing any harm. He's simply carrying. What do you do? We have state? found a very good solution. No, the Kripal should not be allowed. But we have found a very good solution in India. We have reduced the size of the kirpan so that the kirpan is no longer a weapon. And so, the, so we, we found a great compromise. You know, you, the Sikhs can take their kirpans, but those kirpans can't, can't be a threat. What an ingenious solution. I love that solution. But that's the kind of solution that we must look for. You know, in, in France, they banned the chador. In Br Britain has learned from India. They have ruled us for 200 years and don't think that they didn't learn anything from us. We are not the only ones who took everything from them. They also took a lot of things. And one of the things that they learned was this balancing. The balancing of different religious communities. So what if, when this issue of the chador came there, whether they should wear, uh, you know, the chador, uh, the hijab in schools or not. They thought for a while and they said, they should wear them. 
But because they're not, they're only covering their face and a little bit of their body. I mean, what's the big deal about it? The nuns also do it. All we have to make sure is that the color of their hijab must be the same as the rest of the uniform. <laughs> so it's okay. I mean, maybe over a period of time, the debate will be settled and everybody will take their hijabs off. But at the moment, it's not settled, right? So you find a compromise. It's not, every compromise is not a shallow and a bad compromise. There are some compromises which are very, very decent. Balancing of, if many values are, are involved, then balancing of values is much better than giving up one value for the sake of another value. Because both values, I mean, it be a, it be, we'll be living in very impoverished lives. It's very, it's, it's, a, it's, it's terrible if people have to choose between two things that they value. I know sometimes we have to make that hard choice. But I don't think we, 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 we are, we are diminished by that choice. Sometimes we have to make that choice, but we are diminished by that choice. You know, I think it was Ian Foster who said, he made a dramatic you know, if I had to choose between my country and my friend, I hope I have the courage to choose my friend. Of course, he, he, was, he was not allowed to do that, you know. He was sent to the, he was sent uh, uh, to the war, First World War, I can't remember what it was. But, but the fact is that, would you, would you want that choice? I mean, would you want a choice? Saving your mother or your so-called motherland, you wouldn't want that choice. So, uh, I think something has gone wrong. It didn't like my example. <laughs> right. Or perhaps he thinks that we are continuing with this way for too long. Maybe we should do it with an option. Yeah, anybody. Sir, apologies in advance. I'll be leaving after my question. No problem. <laughs> and sir, after the question, not in the middle. I ah, see. Yes, yes. <laughs> sir, I have a doubt. That's <coughs> gone. OK. Yeah. In the light of all you have said, uh, would it be fair now to consider even atheism under the purview of secularism? Sorry? I mean, uh, all you have said about religious domination, inter, inter and all that. Yeah. Now, would it be fair to consider even atheism as one of these religions? Atheism, be... right. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would certainly think that... Let me, you know, listen. <coughs> I told you right in the beginning that this religion secular business is... is, is we, are, we are saddled with these two words and I'd rather get rid of them. Uh, but I, we can't, you know, it's, there is a politics of these words and there is a common usage of these words. It's, it's not up to me to give it up. I can say in my, in bravado that I want to give up these terms and I can, in my academic articles, I can say one of these things, you know, let's just give up these words and so on. The fact of the matter is that these are, these are commonly accepted, they're commonly used in, in so many different ways and we have no choice. But let me... Uh, go back to this, you know, the modern West is made of, is so thought to be made up of two traditions. One is a tradition that was born in Palestine. You surely know what that tradition is. The one that was born in Palestine. Do you know? Huh? What? No, no. No, no, no. One tradition that is actually, no, that Christianity. I mean, the Christian elements are pretty strong and they, Christianity was born in Palestine, right? And the other tradition is born in the Mediterranean, the Greco-Roman tradition. And the modern West is supposed to have oscillated between uh, these two. And, uh, and somehow they've mixed, mixed these two up and, you know, and over a bit, 
period of time, you know, sometimes they have opposed one another, sometimes they have commingled, sometimes they have been friends and so on. Uh, people have had to, people try to marry them, so there were the Neoplatonists who were also Christians and so on. All sorts of things have happened. But notice that, and it's not as if the Christian tradition has no idea. In the Christian tradition, there is a, there are a whole lot of ideas about how to deal with the so-called secular world. And the Greco-Roman tradition, you think it was secular? No, it was not. It had some secular elements, but it was polytheistic. The closest to the, and it's not, it's not surprising, the closest to the Hindus are the Greeks of that time and are the Latinos of that time. They all believed in gods and goddesses and gods appearing and gods disappearing and gods helping human beings and human beings helping gods and you know, all this was, all this, Great transactions were constantly taking place between humans and gods. And that is, you know, that's... You know this. Those of you who know Hindi. You know, and this is the kind of interaction that you have with, uh, with your god in Hinduism. You know, Amitabh Bachchan does it all the time. <laughs> Now, can you imagine uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the serious uh, tradition of Christianity, somebody saying like that, the Christian God is, you're supposed to be overawed by, you know, he's not personal, he's impersonal, at least the deist God is, and you know, you're supposed to just bow before him and, and do everything. But the, this is a personal relationship. Well, Greek gods were exactly like that, and so were Roman gods. So there were gods, and you know, if, if by, if by religion, if Hinduism is religion, the Greco-Roman tradition is equally religious. But what? Can you believe it? The West calls Christianity religion and the Greco-Roman tradition secular. Why the hell is it called secular? I don't know. Undoubtedly there is philosophy there, there is, some, there is reason, there is secularity and all that. But equally in India, there are, you know, the, the Buddha never believed in God or gods. The Jains don't believe in God or gods. They were atheists, the Charvakas, the Lokayats. I would say, I, I, I'm, I'm willing to bet that what we understand, by the way, atheism is a very interesting word, but atheists, atheists, atheism was the orthodoxy in India in, 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 in uh, uh, in the last uh, half of the first millennium BCE. More people may have believed in, in not, not believed in God than those who did believe in God in India at some point of time. The, on, the, on, the, on the side I want to say, you know what, it, you know who the first atheists were, can you guess? Hmm? I know, I mean, that's a good point, but actually it's, I mean, it, it's very, it's, it's instinctively correct in some ways. But the first atheists were the Christians. It's, it's a word that is derived from atheos. Atheos, theos are gods. Those who denied the existence of gods, that is Greek gods. The Christians believed in a supreme God, but they denied the existence of gods. So the Greeks called Christians those who do not believe in our gods, atheists. That's the origin of the word atheist. It's only much later that it became, you know, all those who don't believe in any god or gods are atheists. Uh, but yes, I would consider well, so, so this in, that, the, that's one of the problems in calling it religious, as if I'm leaving out philosophical outlooks. But actually, it's any, it, any kind of outlook I'd like to put in, into the category of religio, let's call it religio-philosophy uh, dom, domination, which includes atheism. If atheists began to dominate religious, 
religious, the religious, meaning modern atheists, not the atheists of Greek times, then I would consider that to be terrible. That's what the state must not do. Right? But likewise, if the religious begin to dominate atheists, which is, which is what they've done for the last 15 centuries, right? In the West, at any rate, anybody who questioned was discriminated against and actually eliminated and so on. The European story is a pretty bloody story. Huh? This liberty, equality, fraternity is something which is born out of the blood of so many people. We don't understand that. We don't realize that. I mean, the Indian story, in that sense, is a much better story. We've not been, you know, killing each other on this basis till very recently when we took over and we destroyed, we, we, we were so, you know, we, we did such a, you know, we, all the pent up energies came out in 1947 and we really had it big, man. <laughs> but, I mean, till the 1940s, I mean, till the 19th century, it was a very, you know, there were skirmishes. There were the so-called riots, the skirmishes, there were some, some, you know, violent uh, incidents, but there were no wars of religion. There's no recorded war of religion in India. Even the story about Buddhism, you know, versus Hinduism is, yeah, there, are, there, have, been, there have been instances, but I think the general belief among historians is not that the Buddhists were eliminated by the, by the so-called Hindus or the Brahminical Vedic, Vedic Brahminans, but they were, they were just partly absorbed and partly uh, kind of, they just turned away and went away, although this is not entirely true. Huh? In Bengal, there was some, some violence, a lot of violence, but overall, I would say it's been a it's a decent story as far as religious violence is concerned. Till the 20th century, my God, we, we we just made up for all the all the you know good things in the past by destroying everything, and then it lingers on now. I mean, the impact is still there. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, as you very nicely mentioned, the concept of secular state. Like uh, a state which is completely against any kind of religions, do religious dominance and which is neither anti-religion nor non-religious. But sir, don't you feel somewhere uh, it, it is a very utopian or a, an ideal concept because ultimately at the end of the day it will be managed by some human beings. And they can be, they can be prejudiced or oriented towards their own religion or whatever, whatever orientation they follow. So ultimately it will lead to some kind of prejudice or... Uh, biasness. Yeah, I mean, no, I wouldn't call it utopian. I would call it uh, difficult to achieve, but I wouldn't call it utopian. You know, as I just told you, there were, in India, actually India presents a much more hopeful picture. If you look at the entire history of India. Actually, the world over, you know, take for example Palestine, I mentioned Palestine. The Muslims and Jews lived very, very comfortably with each other. It was the Christians and the Jews who had problems. The Muslim and Jews had never had problems, till modern nationalism. So I don't think, I don't think it's utopian. And I think, as a matter of fact, the motivation in people to resist any kind of oppression today is very strong. People want, people don't want uh, things to be imposed. I mean, I, I mean, that idea is, is, you know, gripping people more and more. You can't, you can't break their spirits today. But you could earlier. Today you can be defeated, but you won't, you won't, you, you know, you won't be defeated for too long. People will rise. So this, this idea that one, one group is dominating you and one person is dominating you or one person, you know, I think this people, it's, it's caught on, you know. It's caught on and it's, it's something that people find difficult to accept. You have to be very subtle and, you know, you've got to find... But, I mean, you are right in some ways. I mean, there are, there are all kinds of 
very subtle and not so subtle ways in which there are people who are out to get you. I mean, and uh, I, I was yesterday. I was on. You know, I I, I don't go on television very much. Uh, I I don't like that medium, and. Uh, I, you know, basically I need two hours to talk and that medium gives you only two minutes. So I don't really like, but the, in that, the Doodarshan and Rajya Sabha television are okay. You know, sometimes they give you ten minutes and so on. <laughs> they are, not many people watch them, but it's a better channel. They are better channels. And so sometimes, you know, when, they, when there's too much, they insist too much, I go on, uh, on these channels. And I, uh, yesterday, I think, uh, I don't know. Why did I mention this? What was the question I was talking? <laughs> See, too much talk about yourself, and you you finish. Uh, you basically. You know, what was the question? Sorry, again. It was just like uh, somewhere the concept is too utopian to achieve. Yes. Uh, yeah. I. I will, What I was. Yes. Now the the more realistic, more more realist, uh, realistic moment, and the mom the moment of uh, kind of of hopelessness, which is also there. I, today, I believe, we were talking about, you know, our, my, my center is in the news these days because one of my uh, former colleagues who's attached to the center has been hounded by, by, by some, by, by, by groups in, uh, you know, Ashish Nandi is. And uh, yesterday, I, that's what motivated me to go on television. and. I, I said one thing, and please, uh, you tell me whether I'm wrong. So freedom of expression is just a right which is given to us in the abstract in the Constitution. But you must have the, you must have the ability, right, and a real power to exercise that freedom. Ordinary people should have that power. But what is happening today? I think people who have the capacity to mobilize thousands of people, those who have social power, those who have economic power and those who have political power, they have as much freedom as they want to speak what they want. And they can malign you, they can denigrate you, they can destroy you, they can say that, you know, they can say and get away with anything. You know, if we uh, look at what Mr. Thakre said, I mean, if, about rape that takes place in Delhi, he says, Biharis are responsible for it. <laughs> Anything that goes wrong in Bombay, Biharis are responsible for it. It's a whole group of people. I'm surprised that Biharis are not reacting. I mean, it's, it's, it's a limit. But he gets away with it. Why does he get away with it? Why can't he be put in, uh, in, in uh, behind bars? I'm going to be caught for saying that. <laughs> under, under, under some act, you know, some... Anti SCST, I not anti some anti Maharashtrian. <laughs> what, what can one do? I mean, what a place we are living in. I mean, so yes, I mean maybe it's utopian. Sometimes I, I really wonder if anything, uh, you know, we we are, we are living in very hopeless times. But on the other hand, I feel that you know there is a lot of movement. People are people react, people respond, people protest. There are more protests taking place in India than any other place in the world. I'm pretty certain of that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sir, I have. A there was a gentleman there at the back. I think let him, let him say, you know, let him speak no. first, and then. Okay, you were first. I was in. All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right. I so please, uh, I don't want to. Uh, I I seem to have excited only men. I mean, that's a very unfair. <laughs> Please, sir. Yeah, to be a, a response from some women as well. Sir, I have a, a confusion with some words. Yeah. Uh, like uh, in many instances, I have come across that the word. Yeah, wait, wait. Abhi picture khatam nahi hoi hai, yaro. Abhi to chal rahi hai. Aadhi ki paaki hai. Should I ask? Uh, the word rationalist uh, is yes. sometimes, or most of the times, is hijacked by self-proclaimed atheist or atheism. Uh, I want to ask, is there any 
means a relation between atheism and uh, this rationalism or a man can be religious as well as well rationalist and how these two words are related with secularism also means if you mix the three words how they are interrelated or not please come in good question thank you all the questions have been good but uh, there's a no i i think uh, look uh, religion is at least two things one is what i call piety right there is there is a surrender or love or adoration of something which is much larger than you and which is kind of non-human not another human being we love and adore other human beings right but that nobody calls religion but there is when we go a little beyond that it could be nature it could be something extra natural it can be some idea that's right now that's one aspect of it. the other part of religion is that it's a tradition it's a cumulative tradition which has uh, generated a lot of sort of philosophical ideas uh, symbologies uh, symbolisms and and a lot of uh, uh, practices uh, stories narratives poetry art painting you know all sorts of ways in which we express ourselves and come to know ourselves which has become part of our tradition and heritage and so on and so forth now so this tradition has also nurtured reason so reason and religion have been very strongly tied to each other it's not as if they've always been opposed to each other they've been tied to each other but at some moments which can last for very long some people within that religion can reinterpret religion in such a way that they begin to oppose re reason and religion so and rationalism and religion become opposed to each other so my answer is yes and no uh, it can it can you know it can both be on the side of reason can be historically all all so called religions have nurtured reason <laughs> but there have been moments in the life of every religion when they have turned against reason as well and i think atheism can also be exactly like that atheism has always again sided with reason but when it becomes virulent and fanatical and becomes excessively dogmatic and when it's not be, be willing to listen to the point of religion at all after all what is reason reason is not just you know what uh, galileo thought it was or what hobbes thought it was it's it's a it's a capacity by which we uh it's 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 a it's it's a it's a it's following a certain process and the use of a capacity to arrive at certain judgments about things and about people and about variety of issues that's what reason is and i think uh, atheists can also stop you know i think that i know a lot of atheists who were so blind to the to the to the good things in religious traditions that uh, i i wonder if they are using their reason when they when they do that so uh when secularism sec again i mean i think the answer to that is that there are both forms of I, you know the secularism that i'm talking about is certainly with reason and not against it but there can be some secularisms that are anti reason because they when you when you when you become too arrogant and take it upon yourself as the final arbiter requiring no dialogue or interaction with the other then you have stopped reasoning reason is a social capacity 
you reason again you reason with others and reasoning within yourself is a very small aspect of reasoning with others and if you stop reasoning with others you'll stop reasoning over a period of time you'll stop reasoning totally and this can happen to any 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 ism and any system okay that's the okay yeah now there in the in many recent events, we have seen that the freedom, the freedom of speech is denied for persons in the reason that uh, the religious emotions is hurt. So my yeah. freedom of speech is denied in the name that the religious emotions of the religion is hurt. So my question is, how a secular state should uh, response to it. Whether it should stand for the freedom of speech, or yeah. it should go with the religious uh, emotions. I, you know what I'll do. I'll take some questions all together because I'm informed that, and I will. My preference is for the person there because she's the lone voice. So I want to hear her before I hear all the hymns. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. So um, you you distinguish between internal and external religious diversity, and when you use the term internal religious diversity, I assumed that you were referring to uh, a diversity on an individual level. That is a diversity of religious impulses on an individual level, which ah. I think is uh, richly available in India. Right. 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 And if we could capitalize on this, I mean, if we could. Um, in the name of secularism, if we could, if there could be greater reminders to the population at large that we are at once members of various religions, yep. uh, that might in fact make a stronger case for, make yeah. a more uh, emotional. Yeah, yeah, case I didn't for. mention that, and I completely agree with you. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute uh, when I hear two or three other questions. I think one over there. Because I think I've been sort of looking only at this side, and now I'm going to look at that side. So the green, uh, the green shirt, please. I can. Yeah. Okay. Um, so when you define secularism, you said um, it's domination of, of in a, a state that um, does not do anything when one religion dominates over the other. Um, that is non-secular, and, and a religion that does something to stop it, that is secular. So my question to you is, in India we often see that um, a, a, lot of, um, a, a lot of groups play on religious sentiments to further their cause. So this is not, this is, this doesn't exactly fall under dominance. I mean it's not like um, these parties or whoever they are, it's not like they're, uh, they're, domin they're, they're allowing one religion to dominate over the other. But they're just playing on these emotions to further their own cause. So are states which allow this, are they secular or are they not? Right. Yeah, yeah. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So. Uh, my question is, uh, you, uh, I really agree with your secular concept, but my question is, is that really practical? For yeah. example, uh, you know, India is a secular democratic state in the world, one of the best. But still what we see here is, taking an example, you know, the case of Abdul Nasser Mahadani, who was put in jail for, the, uh, for a decade for no cause. At the same time, we see uh, people like LK Adwani, uh, by Libra, Librahan Commission says he is culpable, but still they are living happily here. So, isn't there is a, a domination of the religion or to the minority minor religions in India actually happening, making a fear for the minorities here? That's my question. We'll take one more question and you can meet the speaker later. So, sir, uh, I didn't understand whether you are talking about religious neutrality like uh, the British employed, like, uh, yeah, uh, I'm not interested in your uh, religious life, it's your interest, whether to, whether you follow it or not, I'm not uh, interested, I'm only interested in collecting the tax. Yes. So, uh, in that case, if you see, uh, earlier, uh, I mean, I'm, uh, say in, uh, uh, say, maybe four or five hundred years back when kings were ruling, 
that time that this uh, brahmanas were uh, only studying vedas and uh, their livelihood was uh, obtained by like people donating arms to them or the king supporting uh, uh, financially so but now what happens is that uh, uh, the government doesn't involve in such things and uh, uh, these people who are not actually not able to uh, make a livelihood out of this vedic uh, 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 reading and these things well, uh, so then what happens is that uh, now everybody wants to call uh, these uh, uh, priests to chant mantras for their marriages but nobody is interested in giving daughters for them to marry so <laughs> because uh, they are not making any good livelihood because of that so earlier at least kings were supporting that uh, but now we don't see any such support and uh, people are also just paying tax to the government so uh, so like uh, if you see uh, and you said that this religious rituals or whatever are the expressions of say uh, are uh, maybe inherent beliefs or whatever so it's not that only rituals are there they have inherent meanings also Uh, so if you just say religious neutrality is what government or whatever the state should follow it means that actually it should not actually uh, support any of the things but rather i feel it would be very nice if they support financially like yeah yes they they collect taxes okay <laughs> they collect taxes yes we say for example they collect taxes from say hindu community and then they help uh, with those tax money help the hindu community in developing growing their village their, their, their community better why not they collecting the taxes from hindu community and you using the same taxes for religious purposes why should not government do that why should government just pay collect taxes that's it i am not interested in any more other than your like uh, yeah well, uh, let me begin with this uh, briefly i won't be able to this is a serious question i can't you know to i can't devote too much time because i've run out of time no i think you are right about the british state they were neutral because they were interested in the taxes of the subjects they were not interested in what religion they had after 1857 by the way before 1857 they were interested they were interested in a big way uh, i mean there were there were christian missionaries who were uh, kind of there for for you know as part of the civilizing mission the 1857 taught them a lesson that better not interfere with people's religions because otherwise they will be revolted and so on and so you're right about post 1857 british state uh indian state is not like that indian state is not neutral indian state actually has you know it, it does a lot of things for religions it doesn't do exactly what you were saying but it i mean I've, uh, but it does a lot of things i mean uh, you know the, you, you know the alabad the kumbh mela is going on right now uh, millions of people are there all the all the arrangements are made by the state i don't think the kumbh mela can take place even for a minute today unless there is massive state bandobast okay uh then there is some money which goes to the hajj pilgrims uh there are many uh, temples which have been reconstructed by the state right thus if, if there are educational institutions which are run by religious groups they can on an equal basis this is this they can ask funds from the state and they get funds from the state those schools which are run by they're not they're not public schools they're private schools in the in the sense they're owned by trust uh, religious groups whether they're sikh or muslim or hindus they can ask funds from the state and they can get it of course once they get funds from the state there are certain conditions that they have to fulfill right but that is okay i think if the state if the people are paying taxes then they will expect certain things to happen right uh and and uh, so so there are the state in india doesn't adopt a policy of i'm not going to interfere the state in india adopts a policy of what i call principal distance i haven't talked about it because there was no time but it's an act, they 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 interfere when there is exploitation but in other cases they bolster religions they help them they help them grow they nurture them 
They are pro-religion and anti-religion. And this is critical respect. They respect religions also. They respect all religions uh, in theory. Uh, but but, uh, but uh, they also, when they, it's part of respecting all religions that they can also interfere in, in those practices of many religions where they are, there's a lot of oppression and exploitation going on. So yeah, the state is not it's not it's not it's not the the state of the British times. It is a different state in India after the constitution was set up. Okay, one one uh, Then uh, let me uh, I, you know uh, this is part of what is meant by religion. When religions come into the scene, you have... Let me tell you a story. It's a, partly a fictitious story, but it's, it's also true of some. Let's say, in the beginning, there is a teacher, a great charismatic teacher. And there are people who start following him. Then these followers begin to see that there is some fellowship. They, they, you know, they like each other or they, they bond with one another because they imbibe the teaching and they feel that they are, you know, that they have the same values and so on. The third stage, they form a, some kind of a community, which is like a they still probably don't have a name for themselves. They don't call themselves as anything, but they still form a community. Then, as the community becomes large, they need to organize it. They need they introduce institutional structures. And they begin to have something like a church. Or you might have, you know, some, uh, what is it? The, what is the Sikh version of that? Is there anybody here? Huh? Not the Gurudwara, but the... Prabandak committee, Gurdwara Prabandak, some, you know, some committee, right? I, I'm sorry, I forget, forgetting, but, okay, some, and then they posit an intellectual doctrine, which is in present in, they believe, one scripture, or maybe two scriptures. They say, well, this is, you know, these are the, and then everybody begins to define themselves in relation to that scripture and that organization and this sort of thing. And they demarcate themselves very sharply from other communities. Now, in this process, we have a religion. You have a re now you've got a religion. At the end of this process, you've got a religion. Take, for example, Buddha. Buddha was only a, you know, a teacher. He thought and thought and thought and he had enlightenment and suddenly there are a lot of followers. He was a philosopher, the philosopher, thinker, teacher. And it was only much later that you had something like a religion called Buddhism. And even though Buddhism till very recently, Buddhism, you know, Buddhism is a missionary religion. It wants to make other people Buddhist. But it's a very different missionary religion from other missionary religions. You know what it's, till very recently at least, or maybe even today it's like that. You know what it used to say? It used to say, look, you become Buddhist, or you become, you follow the teachings of Buddha, but you don't have to leave your own religion. Whatever you're following, you keep following. Now, this is what you were talking about. Pre-religion phenomena. Because religion means that you belong exclusively to this and not to anything else. Or you have to leave this and you have to leave this before you take on something else. That's conversion. You leave this and you take on something else. In South, in the whole of Asia actually, China, Japan, Korea, Thailand, India, this entire region, it's, the identities are much more fluid. You are this as well as that, and you are, you can be both. Somebody once counted, there was a census of religions that was taking place. And they discovered that uh, in Japan, I think, or 
and, and even in China, you know, I'll tell you about China, in Japan, there was a sense of, and they found that there were, there can be only, a, total must add up to 100%, but the Buddhists were 53%, the Shintoists were 62%, and uh, something else was 38%. So people began to wonder, you who cares? How is it possible? But because one person said that he is both a Buddhist and a Shintoist, what's the problem? Some people said that they are this, this and this, all three. <laughs> now this is also true of, of many communities in India, at least till very recently. You know, the, the Mio's have become very kind of sectarian today. Till 50 years ago, all their names was Ram Muhammad, Krishna Khan, and uh, you know they 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 were they had all their traditions talked about uh, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata as much as and this is true even today in Indonesia for example in, in Indonesia people don't feel that there's anything incompatible between the two they are devout Muslims and their main uh, main that their religious tradition is Mahabharata and Ramayana. The names, when I went to Indonesia in 1994, there was a driver who was driving the car and I asked him, you know, what's his, what his name was. He said, my name is, he said it in a slightly different accent, I can't remember that, I can't actually recall it. He said his name was Yudhishthira. Yudhishthira. And 10 minutes later, he stopped the car and said he has to have, he has to, uh, could do his namaz. Uh, he didn't seem to think that there was anything, uh, anything particularly problematic about it. But the first person that I ever met from Indonesia was a person called Prabobo. He was a student uh, at Oxford, and I was he was my neighbor, and I I never figured out what his name really was, till one day we we had dinner together, and he told me his name was. Prabhobo, and I said, what, what does it mean? He said, influence. And then I realized, God, it must be Prabhav. <laughs> Prabhav has become Prabhobo. <laughs> now, what I'm saying is that this is a very, I, I want to celebrate it. It's nothing. They, why? I mean, they put, I teach political thought all the time, you know, to my students. I, and I, I love each thinker that I I hate to be classified as belonging only to one. I hate to become a Kantian or a Marxist or a Hegelian. <laughs> but I, I like Hobbes, I like Locke, I like Machiavelli, I like, I like all of them. I like all their teachings. And I, I don't like every aspect of their teaching. I like a lot of their teaching. I don't want to belong to just one. I, belong to, I, I want to belong to everything or I, I, and I, or I want to say I don't belong to anything. But I love all of them. And I want to see, it would be a wonderful world if people began to see their religions also like that. Not to think of belonging exclusively to this at the expense of that. You know, I, I think that's, that's a, unfortunately it has happened. Uh, these, uh, many of the reform movements are actually like that. Some reform movements are centered on reform, you know, giving freedom and equality to people, but some reform movements in Christianity first, and then in other religions, were actually purification movements. Expel everything that some people at that time believed was the pure version of their religion. They wanted to expel everything from that. And I think those were disastrous movements, and they are modern movements. It's a product of modernity. You know, this idea of it's a, it's, it's something. Protestantism was a bit like that. It all began, you know, the, the, the purging of, from Catholicism, the purging of all the pagan elements. So there were, you know, suddenly there were many, many more witchcrafts, uh, witches. Why were there many more witches? Because all they were doing were indulging in what they called pagan practices. You know, they had their own little shrines, they were worshipping some, you know, uh, some uh, wheat, uh, uh, wheat, uh, they were doing some rituals around uh, the harvest rituals and so on and so forth. 
and they were suddenly branded. These are these are these are heretics. They're witch. They're they they're doing witchcraft. They should be killed. They should be hanged. And they this kind of business started. And suddenly the you know the idea of the witch and the witch witchcraft was there. But suddenly in the 16th century, the number of witches and the number of witchcraft persecution increased a lot during the Reformation. I think that this is a bit of a disaster. I mean, it's it's a recipe for for human. Uh, I mean, it's, it's killing human solidarity, <coughs> not uh, saving it. But and I think that's where I want to end. I think I'm sorry I've not answered all the questions, but I think I better end otherwise. <laughs> It was really a thought-provoking, educating session on secularism. Uh, of course, I think you all had your dinner and you're not hungry. <laughs> so, uh, as a token of a conventional uh, appreciation ritual practice, uh, I would like to call upon uh, Ms. Professor Milinde Brahme, Milin Brahme, sorry, <laughs> to present a memento to Dr. Rajiv Bhatka. Thank you so much, Professor Nidhi. So, uh, that brings us to the end of today's long EMLs. <laughs> Fine. Uh, uh, to be updated about the upcoming EMLs, you know, please visit eml.iitm.ac.in or check the Facebook page. Thank you. Subbu, are you here? Subbu. Yep, come, come. Good.